I'm Martha Johnson, Director of the Mayor Museum of Art at Randolph College, and I'd like to welcome you to the 29th Annual Helen Clark Berlin Symposium. This is the first time we have presented this symposium virtually, so that means we are making history together. It was a year ago today that our students left for spring break and they never came back until a few weeks ago. We are delighted to be officially in person this semester and are happy to modify our programming to keep everyone healthy. I wanna thank our curator of education, Laura McManus, for coordinating today's panel. We can help her out by muting our mics to minimize competing sounds. And for best results, choose the speaker view as opposed to the gallery view on the upper right corner. Also, as you think of questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat feature below, but we will save all questions until the very end and Laura will facilitate a Q&A at that time. The Berlin Symposium is always held in conjunction with the college's annual exhibition of contemporary art. Before we get started, I would like to thank Mary Gray Shockey, class of 1969 and former trustee, who has generously supported every annual exhibition since the 100th, including this, the 109th. The first annual, was, annual exhibition was installed in 1911 and it's the longest running series of original exhibitions of contemporary art staged annually by any academic institution in the United States. On the occasion of the 80th annual, friends and family of Helen Clark Berlind, class of 1958, established a symposium in her honor, which would extend and expand the educational impact of the exhibition. I am honored to introduce Ann Wilkes Tucker, class of 1967, former trustee, friend, colleague, champion of photography and photographers, and exceptionally gifted curator. Ann is curator, curator emerita for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. During her tenure, she acquired over 30,000 photographs and curated over 40 exhibitions. She was selected as America's Best Curator by Time Magazine in 2001. 2019, she received the award for curatorship and an honorary fellowship from the Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain. Anne curated the 109th Exhibition of Contemporary Art currently on view and also the 94th Annual in 2005 entitled Documenting Poetry, Contemporary Latin American Photography. This year's annual is entitled Time and Place, Water, Sky, Land. It presents four American artists interested in human connection to the natural world. James Baylog, Erica Blumenfeld, Terry Evans, and Mark Klett. We thank these artists for so generously sharing their work. And we thank Anne for her vision in putting them together and for moderating a conversation today with Terry Evans and Mark Klett. Thank you, Anne. There we go. Um, I'm a little embarrassed because I didn't plan uh, an official bio of the two artists that you see in the screen and who will speak to you today. Um, they are both enormously respected in the field. Both have won Guggenheim, um, John Simone Guggenheim Memorial Fellowships, which are very prestigious awards in our field. Um, but more important, um, in the field, people say that some artists just have 10 years in them. And artists that keep going and keep pushing the envelope and keep um, <coughs> building their vision and their skills and their passions um, into ever engaging works of art are very special and very few. Um, and both Mark and Terry 
um, would classify in that area. Um, they were chosen to be in this exhibition because both happen to have, for various reasons, chosen areas and types of landscapes, uh, not exclusively, but largely, um, in the United States, okay. which have been their subject for um, four decades. And um, they've photographed other things and then come back. Mark, for Mark, it's the American West, particularly the American desert. And for Terry, um, it's the Midwest and the Great Plains of America. And um, it's, um, it's just a source of joy for me to see their work evolve and how they can keep walking around a subject and finding other ways to engage and educate and thrill visually uh, stimulating images of these subjects that they know so well. So that is enough for me. And I really want you to hear from them. Um, did we decide who would go first? Harry? Okay, please, thank you. Okay, and thank you so much. Um, I admire Anne's work so much. And actually, Anne was one of the first people, really, outside of family to see the to see the beginnings of this body of work that is uh, in this show. She had come to Chicago for dinner and I mean, she hadn't come to Chicago for dinner, but she had come to Chicago for some meetings and we had dinner together. And um, my husband said, well, we're just across the street. Why don't you show Anne what you're working on? And I said, well, no, you know, I can't impose that on her. Uh, and she was, she insisted. And so, so I showed her the work and she's been very encouraging. And uh, so I'm, I'm very delighted to be part of this show. I also, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with uh, Martha Johnson and with Laura McManus. And, uh, and it's a great pleasure to see my friend, Mark Clett. So, um, so I'm going to share my screen and begin. So um, my, my purpose here today is to talk about the work that's in the show and that whole body of work and, uh, and what it is. But in order to do that, um, I have to go back, back almost 45 years. So, uh, so I'm doing that by starting with um, the work that I did starting in 1978 when I first became acquainted with Prairie. And I was living in Kansas and I got to know the prairie ecosystem. And uh, on an 80 acre piece of prairie that had never been disturbed, it was owned by two people, Nick and Joyce Fent, and they let me come whenever I wanted. And I photographed that prairie as my primary interest for about the next seven or eight years in other prairies in the, in the vicinity. And it became a sort of um, guiding, uh, a guiding force for me in many ways. I learned about the ecology. I learned about um, medicinal uses of plants. I learned about grass systematics. And then gradually I wanted to see the prairie from the air. What did the ground look like? And was it really as above, so below? And that work uh, uh, started as black and white work. And I'm putting this one in 
for a particular reason. This is because I have realized that most of my work extends only, only to the history, only to my history, to the history of white settlement. But this picture, even though you can't, you wouldn't know it unless I told you, this picture holds traces of the people who came before, the uh, Smoky Valley people. And we found uh, artifacts, um, arrowheads and other pieces of, um, of carved stone uh, on this site. This is the site of the old, this is where the old Smoky Hill River ran before it changed its course. And there were camps along the trees there. And then on top of that were layers of white settlement. I found a piece of China with um, markings on it, presumably part of a plate. Um, and so, so it's been really important for me to remember and acknowledge that um, uh, the first people who were here and as uh, naturalist um, Andrew Hip says, um, most of us are guests in this country, but we stayed. Um, I started photographing um, specimens collected on the, on the uh, plains and prairies, usually 19th century specimens uh, collected by the great botanical expeditions to the West. And when I moved to Chicago from Kansas in uh, the early 90s, um, the Field Museum was right down the street and I had uh, access to photograph um, the botanical specimens, the birds. Um, so this was a really different kind of experience than looking at the complexity of the grasses and forbs uh, interwoven on the ground, the, the earlier work I had done. This was the European mind, European uh, immigrants um, traveling to the West and collecting specimens, lifting them out of their ecosystems and bringing them back to try to understand them. This one particularly affects me, this, uh, this trumpeter swan, um, which was um, collected in North Dakota in, um, I think it was 1887. So I'm skipping ahead now uh, to about um, 2011 and my colleague writer Elizabeth Farnsworth and I went to North Dakota to try to explore and understand what was happening with the oil boom there. Uh, what, what I saw was very disturbing. Uh, I saw fracking tearing up the prairie and we spent a couple of years, many trips there um, to, to work on this project about fracking. And when I came home, uh, I wanted to be involved in activist work against this industrialization uh, of, of the landscape. Um, this is a picture from um, some work I did with grassroots activists who were trying to get the um, site of some stored petroleum coal that had been shipped down from the tar sands, very, very dirty coal uh, that is um, used in manufacturing. In fact, is prohibited in many places. They finally, through their uh, activist work, were able to get this, this site moved. Those white things are shower or um, sprayers that were supposed to tamp down the dust, but, but it didn't really work and it got in people's lungs and cars and homes. Um, when I finished that activist work, well, I mean, I hope I'm never finished with activist work, but when I finished that particular work of looking at the industrial landscape as my primary work for the preceding five or more years, I had this longing to return to Prairie. And of course you realize I have skipped over um, about 30 years of other projects. Um, I started going to, I started visiting prairie uh, reserves that were in the Chicago area and photographing them. And as I had done 
40 years earlier, but they didn't, the pictures, I would line them up on my front wall and they were beautiful because the prairie was beautiful, but they weren't very interesting. They didn't come even close to the experience that I had of walking through. And, and this particular picture is from the fence prairie. I showed you pictures of the ground from there, single isolated pictures. Um, this picture is made from images that I compiled over um, three days at peak blooming season in late May of 2018. Uh, I had already earlier uh, begun these, I never quite know what to call these. I think um, maybe constructed images. Um, so what, what I'm trying to do with these is to give the viewer something of the experience of what it feels like to, to walk through uh, one of these protected exquisite landscapes. So this, this particular 80 acre prairie is privately owned and protected that way. Um, this one also, this is in central Illinois this small prairie, it's only about a mile square. You can see it bounded by railroad tracks. And then over on the other side, you can see a road going off in the corner. So I hope you're seeing this whole image and not me up in the corner. Um, and again, this was taken at uh, peak blooming season here in Illinois, that was in uh, June and so I'll go on. This is back at the fence prairie. This is in winter. I went back to photograph uh, this place in winter. And I wanted to point out to you that, in a, and this was made over a, about a week there of many, many visits, a week back in Kansas and many visits to this prairie. But you can see at the bottom, you can see these little footprints of maybe a raccoon. You can see a deer footprint over here. Up here, you can see an antler. And here, you can see some deer running across the meadow. But I'm gonna give you a closer look at, uh, at these deer. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about um, making these pictures is that I can put in details that really require the viewer to spend some time looking and moving with their eyes uh, through, through the image. And it also requires the pictures to be printed large enough that you can do that. Um, so when I was in Chicago, and I began to wander around um, the wooded island at Jackson Park. And this one uh, particular tree really attracted me over and over again, this burr oak tree. And I found out that this particular tree is 300 years old. And there was something about its presence that kept me coming back. And in the winter, often I was the only one there. Um, and the rest of the year, there are always people there on bicycles or taking walks. Um, this one particularly shows a movement through time. Um, I found that these pictures, not only were they about um, moving through and looking, they, they became about time. And this one is about the season of winter. And um, I wanna show you some of the details in this one this little chipmunk that um, you can see here peeking out of this pipe. I really enjoy this. And so there I was very far back from this little chipmunk, but uh, I was able to put, insert that picture. This one is in your show. And, uh, and so was that central Illinois prairie that I showed you. I should have told you a little more about that since it's in your show, um, because it's cared for by one man 
who burns it every season. This one is, um, it's the same burrow that you saw in the winter. And uh, you can see up here, it, I started when it was barely spring. You can just see a little hint of green up here starting. And I finished it down here when it was almost summer. It was clear to me that the greens were changing. It, the season was changing. It was time to stop this one. So what I do is I visit, uh, I visited this tree, I don't know, 15 times. It's close to where I live. It doesn't take long to go over there. And, uh, and then I have a whole range of images. And I don't think about how I'm going to put them together when I'm making the images. I, I simply photograph, I respond to uh, whatever I see that day. And then at the close of the season, when I'm ready um, to start actually making a picture, I have all these source images and I start putting them together uh, in Photoshop. I wanted to show you this one. I, I tried to put, because most of the places I'm photographing are preserved by people, most of them are also open to the public. And so I, I try to put some evidence of human presence. And over here, you can see these bird watchers right here. And I'll show you what they look like. I also want the tree to be the main focus. The human presence is not incidental, but not the main thing. Here are the bird watchers. And this is the same tree in summer. And you can see a man uh, is sitting on a bench reading over here. And this is my friend, Sarah, with her dog, Kiara. Uh, and again, this is one you can see the earlier summer light green leaves. And then towards the end of the summer as they get darker. Here is Sarah with her dog. So I also, I kind of think that each one is telling a story. Each one is made up of many images. And, but, so there's not, you know, there's not a literal narrative, but there is some kind of sense of story there. This actually is one of my favorite ones. This is fall. And you see this kind of orangey square in the middle. I discovered accidentally, uh, I converted the picture to black and white in Photoshop one day just to look at the tones. And this orange, this orange square right here is exactly the same value as the greens here. So when it's converted to black and white, uh, they all look the same. It looks, it's exactly the same gray, just a little bit of color interest there. Um, so let, and this one went through so many iterations. Um, I don't know how many layers and versions of this I've done, but I wanted to show you this piece right here. Here we go. Here's why I like this piece. Do you see that ribbon with the little hearts on it up near the top? That's like a ribbon that my daughter had when she was a little girl. So in, in many ways, these, these pictures become very personal because I feel so much affection for the place and for the history. So I have no idea about the history of that ribbon, but it connects to my own history and my own memories. I'm gonna close with this one. This one is, um, this is night, and when the pandemic started last March and Chicago closed down, Sam, my husband and I drove out to our farmhouse in Kansas. And I was quite shaken by the fact that we were in the middle of a global pandemic. I couldn't, I couldn't quite grasp it. It made me very anxious. I couldn't, I couldn't work. I even remember Ann Tucker calling me one day for some other reason. She said, what are you working on? I said, nothing. I, I can't, I can't even, I can barely think. 
But the thing that relaxed me was every evening, Sam and I would go out to watch the sunset. We would, we would take a walk east. This is an old farmhouse that used to be in Sam's family and is now ours. And we would walk and we would watch the sunset and then we would watch the sky gradually turn to night. And I realized that was something I wanted to make a picture about. And you can see Sam here carrying my tripod. And here is, um, this is an aerial picture. I find that with these pictures, I have to have something that surprises the viewer. Well, I guess another thing is that there are two full moons here. We were there for six weeks, so we saw two full moons. Um, and, but in the end, I had it what I thought was almost done. And there's another, Sam is repeated right here too in the trees. Um, but then I found this aerial picture I had made. I haven't talked too much about my aerial work, but it's a way of uh, relating to the landscape that the prairie uh, horizons are so flat, there's often not much going on between uh, where I'm standing and the horizon. And so the aerial perspective gives me so much information and shows so many relationships. Um, so I don't know, I just put that in the bottom and then the picture felt finished. And here is that picture so you can see it a little better. And then I will close with this picture of Sam. And now um, I'm looking forward to, um, to hearing Mark Klett's, talk, Mark Klett talk about his work. I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Terry. That was great. And as I've said, I love that picture at the end. That, that's just amazing to me. And I love this new work. I want to thank um, uh, Laura and Martha and, and especially Anne for inviting me to be here and to be part of the show. And I will, I will begin by sharing my screen here, which I hope you can see. Does that look right? Okay. I'm gonna, gonna just show a little bit the, this book that came out this year, Seeing Time, which is a 40 year retrospective because Anne did the uh, interview for this book. And I just wanna thank her once again, cause it's an amazing interview. I couldn't have asked for a better uh, curator to work with on this, but I'm gonna talk about my work in general and then also tie in uh, the work that uh, I, have in the show. So the, what, th these are the things that really interest me. If I had to pinpoint what are the things that, that I'm most interested in in photography, I would say time, landscapes, human stories that are related to those two things, methods of representation, and technology. Th those are things that really interest me. And when I started, uh, I didn't start in uh, art, I started in science. And I wanted to mention this because there may be some students here trying to figure out what they're trying to do with their lives. And when I started, uh, when I finished undergraduate school, I had a degree in geology. And uh, this was me working for the US Geological Survey in Montana. And I liked geology, I really enjoyed it. I could have been happy there, but to be honest, uh, what happened was three years later, this was me uh, working for what was called the Rephotographic Survey Project in Yellowstone. I'm talking to the ranger about ready to photograph Old Faithful. I'm wearing the Visual Studies Workshop t-shirt where I went to graduate school, which is the same place that Anne went to. And working on what became this project here, Second View, the Rephotographic Survey Project with my collaborators, Ellen Manchester and Joanne Verberg. The whole idea behind the project was to take a historic image like this by Timothy O'Sullivan in of Green River, Wyoming in, in the late 1860s, early, in this case, early 1870s, go back and then try to make a new picture at the same place and basically create a diptych, which you see here. And there's a lot of change that happened in Green River. The, this was pretty hard to do in the late 1970s when we started working with analog materials 
And the idea was to be as precise as possible. So I'm beginning to understand that my geology background is coming in handy, looking at the types of changes in the American West. Here you see Pyramid Lake by O'Sullivan on the left in the late 1860s. And then you know, the way it was in the late 1970s where the water had dropped down. We, we later revisited this place for an extension of this project called Third View by that time, the technology had changed and we were able to create this uh, larger panorama. This is the late 1990s in which we were then be able to embed uh, this O'Sullivan picture into the panorama. That's because uh, the digital technology like Photoshop became possible. So you're seeing that Terry and I are sh sharing some of the same methods here using digital technology. There were three, I think, thematic things that happened for my work uh, dealing with what we call re-photography or going back to historic places. We're documenting physical change, examining the history of the view and also the maker of the view, and then thinking about conceptual art strategies. How can you make two pictures look similar or how can you relate two pictures? There were a number of projects that I, that I did uh, with some other collaborators, in this case, Byron Wolf, who was a student of mine uh, as a graduate student who worked on Third View. Uh, this project was finished about 2012 with this book, Reconstructing the View on the Grand Canyon. And the, the idea was similar. This is a picture of a, of a, of a painter, actually, Arthur Wesley Dow, gingerly uh, placing his camera on the edge of the canyon to make a photograph. And then we just would go back there and step back a little bit. And we got this uh, combination where now the park service has put up a railing to make sure everybody's safe. I love this person with the crutches on the other side. Uh, but um, this picture is in the show. And this is an example of how we would work. We, we might be at the El Tovar Lounge in, in uh, the South Rim of the Grand Canyon and be surfing on the free internet there. And we come across this page on the USGS, this panorama from Point Sublime in 1882 by William Holmes. We thought, this is cool. We got to check this out. So we download this picture. It's actually in three parts. We would download the middle, then the right and the left-hand parts and put them together into this one panorama, which was meant to show the view over a one-day period. Um, and then we would go to Point Sublime and spend several days there and making pictures. And it's kind of like what Terry was saying. We didn't know what we were going to do. We just started making pictures. So we'd make a picture here, the picture of the river in the distance. And we could actually embed that into the view because the, the home's drawing is so accurate. We could actually do this. And we would then say, oh, here's a morning picture. We can put that in too. Uh, then here's a, 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 a vulture flying overhead. We can put that in anywhere actually. And then another morning view. So we ended up uh, eventually, this is all done in the studio, um, you know, putting all these pieces together to create this final view. And I, I think that what we were doing in the end was kind of comparing the difference between a 19th century view of the Grand Canyon, which was Holmes's view of this kind of significant lighting that he had and then our particular 21st century view of going back to the canyon and looking at individual moments and recognizing that photography uh, captures individual moments, not, not this omnipotent idea, and placing them into the other view. I mean, the, the Holmes view is incredibly beautiful and we didn't want to mess it up too much, but we like the idea of putting over one laying over top of the other and creating this uh, difference between the 19th and the 21st centuries. Uh, another thing that sort of drives me and in, in some of the work that I do and, and collaborate on is the environment and climate change. And this was a project that I collaborated on with Byron Wolf, who you see standing there, and Rebecca Solnit, the writer who is sitting uh, there on the left. And we're sorting out pictures from what became this project, Ground River, published uh, just a few years ago by Radius Books. And um, this book was actually a book that was an answer to another book. It was an answer to this book here by Elliot Porter called The Place No One Knew, Glen Canyon on the Colorado. And this Porter's book came out in 1963. And what Porter was doing was creating with the Sierra Club an, an elegy for a lost place. And the lost place was 
Glen Canyon. When we published our book, uh, we actually um, included part of the, uh, the original um, Porter book inside of ours because most people don't have access to this book anymore. It's long out of print. So we published a little bit of it just so you could get a sense of it. And if you don't know where we're talking about, this will kind of pinpoint it uh, as we zoom in to just the pretty much the of Utah and Arizona is the Glen Canyon Dam. The Glen Canyon Dam was built in 1963 or finished then, and it created Lake Powell, which is about 150 kilometers long. It's a very, very big lake that dammed up the river of the Colorado and then eventually drowned Glen Canyon. So what we were trying to do in this project was find what we could, the remnant of what Elliot Porter photographed in his book which we knew would now be underwater. So we were going back to some of the same canyons, the same locations and making pictures that reflected upon Porter's work, but could not rephotograph it, could not repeat it. So the book is a combination of, of pictures that Byron and I made and Rebecca's writing, which you see a page example here. And this is just an example of how our pictures would reflect, some of them would reflect on Porter's. The picture on the left is by Porter, and you see uh, his reflection of a rock feature. And then the picture that I made of Byron is one of him standing in this reflecting pool, kind of reminiscent of the Porter picture. And what we're trying to do is call attention to the fact that this place is not only a place where a, a river drowned a canyon, but the river itself is changing. The, the lake itself is changing and disappearing. Here you see a picture of the, what, what they call the bathtub ring on the walls of the canyon where the water used to be and created this white ring because the water is dropped. It's now dropping and getting lower and lower. And then we also photographed artifacts like the somebody left this jacket on the left and on the right, or, I'm sorry, on the right and then the left is uh, that stone that Rebecca's holding on the left side is actually a lithic shard that was done by primitive, or I shouldn't say that, by early um, people. And then this is a picture of a uh, uh, what used to be a picnic table on the edge of the lake, but the lake is no longer there because the lake is, is uh, disappearing. And it's disappearing ultimately because of drought, which is caused by climate change. Uh, so this is a story in the sense of creating a lake, drowning by drowning a canyon. And with the loss of that canyon, but also the canyon now starting to come back because we can see here on the left of this rephotograph, th these, are, these two pictures are made two years apart. And you see here on the, on the left, a picture in 2012. Uh, and on the right is the same place two years later. The lake at the north end is filling with sediment and then the river is beginning to cut a new course through that sediment and it basically it will recut the canyon over time. So this was a story of hubris and the loss of a canyon and the story that the canyon will one day reemerge. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about my practice uh, because it's changed a lot and you know for people who are curious about the way that I work, uh, this is the way I used to work. This is a four by five camera you see set up here. And I'm taking a picture and holding in my hand this Polaroid material that goes through the camera and it gives a positive negative. And I put the negative into the little bucket there that's beneath my feet. And so that becomes a very high quality negative that I would use to make pictures like this. And you see the edges and the edges are part of the process of the peeling apart of the Polaroid film. And I decided to leave the whole thing. This is called Beneath the Gray Arch. So for 20 years, I made pictures in the Southwest just um, on my trips. And so these became kind of like my diaristic approach to making landscape photographs, entering a narrow cave. I'm just showing you a few examples. Uh, Under the Dark Cloth, Monument Valley, which is kind of a, a tribute to the fact that photography is, has basically created much of what we think we know about the landscape because the, the iconic features of the landscape were defined literally by a lot of photography, in this case, Monument Valley. And this is contemplating the view at Muley Point, which is a self-portrait. I had this very long self-timer and I was able to get up there. 
I think that the point is that when I was working this way with black and white materials and film, uh, back in the days when I did a lot of analog work, I liked this material because I could see what I was getting when I was on site because it was a Polaroid material that also had a high quality negative to it. Uh, but then uh, things changed. That film stopped being made anymore. And now uh, I work in a very different way. This is a picture of Byron Wolf and I at Lake Powell. We were doing that project with all our digital equipment we take with us, the cameras, the digital backs, the hard drives, the, the laptops, I mean, all these different things that we take with us to, to get our work done. And um, this has been a progress and a, a progressive thing for me. This was my first digital camera that I bought in 1998. It was 1.5 megapixels <laughs> and it cost like $800. It was kind of crazy. Couldn't do much with that. This is what I use today, which is um, a, more like a view camera with a digital back that's 100 megapixels. So it's capable of producing really huge and really highly detailed prints. I love working with it actually. This is my studio. This is what's behind me right now as I'm speaking. Uh, this is the area in which I make prints now. And this is kind of the command central I'm sitting at with my computers and also the printer that I'm using, which it can make up to 64 inch wide prints. So I can make some really huge prints out of this thing. I'm gonna move in just to finish this up. I'm just gonna talk briefly about some um, work that I do today. One of the projects I'm working on is on saguaros. Uh, the saguaro cactus is kind of the, uh, the symbol of the Sonoran Desert where I live. And I did a book on this, the, on this in about 2007 called Saguaros. You see it here with radius books. And I did this on the Polaroid film because I still had it at that time. This is like a 20 years worth of uh, saguaro photographs but now I make them digitally. So this is what the new pictures I'm doing now. I'm just going out on a regular basis making these pictures of saguaro cacti because I feel like they're uh, the symbol of the place that I live. And as the uh, Native Americans of the uh, Sonoran Desert, Tohono O'odham, uh, realized that the, um, that the saguaros are really like people, they think of them as the souls of their ancestors. And I think they are really incredible um, things. They can grow up to 40 feet high. They can live over 200 years. That's by the, by the way, that was the, next, the fence that crosses into Mexico. And that one was burned by a fire. It may or may not survive. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna finish up by showing you something that actually isn't photography. But if you looked carefully at um, the pictures of my studio, you might have wondered what those sticks were behind me. And Anne, when she saw these and uh, when she came to my studio when we were working on the book, she said, you got to include these. So I just want to show you that I'm working on other things um, besides that are related to landscape and time, but are actually sculptural. This is, this is what they are. This is a game that we play when we're camping. Uh, I would uh, draw uh, a circle in the dirt at night that's about six foot in diameter and put a stick in the middle of it. And the object of the game is to put a marker on the circle and guess where the first light of the sun will hit the stick and cast a shadow. And that's what you're seeing here. You can see a shadow and some markers. And I'll just show you some of the sticks. Uh, and the sticks are made out of various things that I find. Um, on the journeys that I take. So like the left hand stick is made out of 50 caliber bullets and, and shells that were found on the bombing range, the Goldwater bombing range where I go. On the right is a stick made out of bottle caps. And so all these sticks, they're kind of symbols of the journey. They're things that I find out where I go and I put them together. Sometimes I carve them. Sometimes they're objects I wire up. Uh, and then other times they're um, they're just, you know, simple sticks that I find and, and do one simple thing to. Uh, the one that's kind of the second from the right came from the Grand Canyon and the little rock in the center of it resembles a rock that we found in the Grand Canyon, this, this rock feature that's kind of famous in the Grand Canyon. 
that uh, stick on the left is uh, made with a toilet float that was found out in the desert. It's kind of my uh, view of the world at that moment. And uh, then the one on the right is what I call the Zen stick. It's kind of one uh, near uh, Mon uh, Mono Lake in Nevada. So I've got hundreds of these and it's just a sample and I'll finish with this. This is uh, an exhibition I had of them and in uh, Phoenix a few years ago. And that's my daughter, Lena, who uh, is an artist herself and finished up her MFA two years ago here at ASU. And she was the installer of this show. And I love the fact that she was telling me what to do as we were putting it up. She goes, no, no, this has got to go over here. That's got to go over there. So I'll end with that. That's, uh, that's, that's my show. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here if I can figure out how to do this. Just give me a second. Okay, great. I'm gonna hand it over to, who, Martha? I can't remember. <laughs> I think Anne will. Anne, okay, yeah. yeah. The discussion. Okay. Um, you know, wow. I, I <laughs> for those of you in the audience, um, when you hear two articulate people like Mark and Terry, um, the transition seem logical or natural. Um, but, um, you know, it's taking those steps from um, where you were going into a totally different locality or perspective or changing your technology or going from black and white to color or going from single image to diptych or panoramic or now the insertions. Um, each of those takes courage. And um, it always, I mean, I always think about an astronaut that I had the enormous pleasure to work with uh, on an exhibition of NASA pictures. And um, he was the first astronaut to step off the, pace, the spaceship with a backpack that had only been tested, not in gravity free um, situation. And I asked him what it was like, and you can't see me stand up, but what he did was he said, well, I stood in the doorway and I just kept putting my foot sort of out, but not taking that plunge to throw myself into space because he said, you know, the spaceship couldn't turn around and come get me if the backpack didn't work. Um, and, and I've always thought of that as an analogy uh, for an analogous situation for artists who make these kinds of dramatic changes in their work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I hope you all can all appreciate that. Um, one of the questions that we, we talked about, the three of us before coming on, um, was the, the importance of place. Um, Mark has largely, neither exclusively, because um, you're just seeing a tiny microcosm of their work. Um, Mark has largely photographed in the American West and has been particularly committed and fallen in love with the American desert. And Terry, um, in the South, we would say born and raised um, but I don't know how you put it in the Midwest, but the plains are part of her, of her life from, from early stages. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in the component of that intimacy that you both have with these places in that four decade transition and the changes that have gone through your work, um, if that's of interest to you <laughs> to talk about.
Mark, you've been particularly defensive of people dismissing the desert. Um, I don't know if I've been defensive, but I may be dismiss dismissive of that, that opinion. <laughs> I think that, uh, and you know, maybe Terry understands this too, because I, you know, I think that the desert, like the mid, like the prairie, is not often thought of um, by people who haven't been there as, as a place that they would want to spend time. I, I feel that um, people misrepresent in their minds what a place like the desert is because um, it's easy to think of it as just a bunch of sand and there's nothing else there. But in fact, it's a very rich biological area that's, you, you know, when you fly over it, you can notice how green it is. I mean, how full of vegetation it is. And uh, it's very lush and many, the Sonoran Desert's very lush. And uh, it's also rich with human history, which people don't think of either. They think it's just never been populated. But in, in fact, there've been people living in the desert, you know, area for eons, you know, thousands of years. And, and uh, you know, and, and they've managed to survive and, and, and thrive as, as, a, um, as a culture. Uh, and so people don't understand that about this. And I think one, what it takes is for people to spend time. And when I came to Arizona initially 40 years ago, um, I didn't know much about it. I, I was used to, at that point, I was living in Idaho and I was used to the mountains and the trees and the water. And coming down here, it takes a little bit of recalibration, I think. But once you get that, then you, and you understand the subtlety of it, and this is where I think, you know, I, I, what I really admire about what Terry's doing, because, you know, she's photographing two ways. One, and Terry, maybe you can talk about this, that, you know, you're, you've done this above view in an airplane, and then you do this really close up view, where you're getting really close to these plants. And, and this combination of the far away and the close looking is, is this combination of stepping back and getting perspective and close and getting intimate. And I think that the more intimate, and that, that combination, I think, gives you a sense of, of your presence and your ability to be in that. And when you have that, then I think the place changes. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. Thank you, Mark. Um, and one thing I've always appreciated about your work is, um, is your own sense of time that often reflects your own personal history as well as going into a deeper time. Uh, that has always fascinated me. I'd like to hear a little more about that too. Um, but my connection to the prairie, it, the prairies, it's a little different because most of the prairie has been turned into agriculture. And so there are just pockets of of true undisturbed prairie left. And, and when you actually see one of those, you know, you begin to realize um, how much we have changed the landscape. And I didn't talk about this in my um, presentation, but I also am deeply interested in climate change. And um, one thing I hope about uh, these pictures I'm working on now is that is that they might provide a little bit of hope for people to, there is this wisdom in an untouched ecosystem in, in the desert, in the prairie, there's a, a kind of um, botanical, biological wisdom, historical wisdom even, that, um, that somehow in, in this country, I suppose, all over the world, somehow we've been able to dismiss that. And sometimes it's just been necessary because we need the space. But uh, I think these places are so important for that wisdom, for, for what they can, what we can learn from them. You know, it's both, it's both spiritual and intellectual. Well, it's also a kind of, botanical wisdom about what can grow and live next to each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, looking at your pictures, I am stunned by the variety of uh, plants that are within a small space. 
um, as a gardener. It's, you know, it's an, it's, a, it's an education in um, how these uh, quite different species, uh, you know, coexist there. Um, and you said that some of the roots go down extraordinary depths, right? Yeah, some, they can go down 25 feet or more. And so um, one thing I learned early on was that of the entire biomass of the prairie, so what you see above ground growing and what's underground, only 15% of it is above ground. So the other 85% is holding the earth together underground. Very different than a wheat field that has very shallow roots. And so you, you get a lot of soil loss from uh, commercial agriculture. Yeah, I, I wanna pick up on that, um, that point about the, the fact that much of the prairie has not, or has been, you know, uh, is a, is a been done over by human action, you know, been changed. Um, the, the interesting thing about a lot of the places that I go to um, in the desert are it's ironically been preserved because um, the, the best and most pristine parts of the Sonoran Desert are preserved by the Barry Goldwater Bombing Range, um, and which is where there are certain areas where they do live fire and they drop bombs, but much, much of it, most of it is just places where they fly over and it's publicly accessible. And I think it's really interesting how um, you know, what we think of uh, land is used for and that, then in how it's used, you know, and, and I, I like that you were talking about wanting to be hopeful because that's actually my position too. I, and when we did that book on uh, Glen Canyon, um, I think the upshot of that was that, you know, we, you know, there was a lament um, originally because of the loss of Glen Canyon, but looking at you could look at it as a terrible thing that's happening now. Climate change is changing things in a very bad way. But on the other hand, the canyon has this chance to come back. And there's this sense that um, nature, as Rebecca says in the book, the old saying from the, from the 80s, nature bats last, you know, kind of takes place that actually the process is still at work that created the original natural situation. And going back to those processes, they still work. And there was a ton of hope in that. And I, I found that that was um, what kept me going, you know, in that, in that kind of project where you can see something really negative occurring. Mark, um, one way that you and Terry are quite different is that um, pretty much from the beginning, you have worked collaboratively. Um, how do you think that has uh, impacted the directions of your art? Well, I work both ways. You know, as you know, I, I work uh, collaboratively on some projects and then other things I do just by myself. And I like that. I like having uh, working both ways. I think I'm just the kind of person who enjoys working on multiple things at one time. Maybe not too many things as I get older, but I, I do like having, you know, a couple things happening at once two or three things happening. Because what happens is you get stuck and then you know you just wanna put it aside for a while and do something else. And then that gets your brain working in a different way. And then you come up with some different solutions and then you go at the problem again, you know, in a different, with a different mindset. And collaboration is one of those ways of making that happen. You know, one of the reasons I like to work with Byron Wolf is that you know, he's a very imaginative guy. He understands technology extremely well, but also he's just got the right personality for me. He's got a good dry sense of humor and he, um, he likes to have fun. And there is no right or wrong. You know, when you work in collaboration, one of the great things about it is that, um, you know, you don't, you can't just blame yourself if it doesn't work. You could blame the other person. <laughs> but I, I think it's just, you, you kind of have the ability to, to have fun and to, and to play. And, you know, when you're doing it all by yourself, sometimes it gets, it's a really difficult thing to, to move past the roadblocks and stuff. And when you're working in collaboration, you know, your collaborate, collaborators will come up with ideas that you just never thought of, you know, like, oh yeah, that's great, you know, and, or they've got skills that you don't have and they bring it in there. And so w when I work in collaboration, it, it then opens up possibilities for me when I do my work, you know? 
I mean, as my personal work. And so it's, it's a good combination. I just really enjoy it. And I think when you work collaboratively, you have to accept certain rules. And one is that you don't own the work, you both own it, or however many people you're working with own it jointly. And the other thing is that um, you have to allow the other person to have ideas and there are no bad ideas. I mean, you have to agree to that. You just have to agree to the idea that everybody is entitled to put something together that you might think is stupid because there are no stupid ideas. So as long as you can go, as long as you can do that, then you can probably work right. through it. Terry, you don't work at in collaborative in the same way, although you've worked in some projects, but you do work like the, the people that own this land, you, they have to trust you. They have to, for you to get access to, to land like that, you have to build trust over the years and, um, and be secretive is one question I wanted to ask. And then working with the activists was another form of collaboration because there were vision visions that you had that you wanted to photograph, but their campaign had other needs. So were you making two kinds of pictures, pictures that you could see on a wall and pictures that you made available to them for their campaign? Well, let me talk about that. The part about trust, um, yeah, I always, I need to establish uh, trust in the very beginning or, or nothing works. So, um, and, and usually when, when I'm working on something that has to do with someone else's land or um, someone else's town or something, um, I'm there because uh, I'm interested. I have a great curiosity and affection for the place or the people. And so, um, usually I'm able to establish trust. Um, working with the activist group was different and it was more challenging because uh, this is on the Southeast side of Chicago. I, it, it's only maybe 20 minutes from where, car from where I live um, in Hyde Park, uh, also on, on the South side of Chicago. It's, it's, um, it's way down near the Indiana border and it's where the steel mills used to be and it um, is populated largely now by uh, Latinx people, um, many of them originally immigrants from Mexico. Um, and so this, it's a very working class population. Um, I'm used to working with people who are, um, Mixed population, but to to everyone there, I was a person of white privilege, and that's not even wrong. Um, and so establishing trust there was a challenge, but it also was this great education for me because I learned so much. It's much different to read articles about people who feel left out than to walk with them and go on marches with them and go to the meetings and learn what, for example, Pet Coke is doing to their families. And so it was, it was this, it was um, an extreme, one of the most important things I've ever done. And, and I was, I spent probably about five years and I did make a few very close friends there, which were, which was really helpful to me because then they could, um, they could, they could introduce me to people in parts of the neighborhood that I wouldn't have known otherwise until I could find my way around. They accompanied me um, often. So that was very helpful. And then regarding the pictures I actually made, I made my own pictures and then you know, I would see what they could use. The aerial pictures were particularly important for them. And, you know, we were on the same campaign. I was there um, to serve this cause. Uh, I was there to um, hopefully help get rid of Coke Industries who owned 
this uh, this property where that was storing the uh, the filthy pet coke. And so, you know, I, I was working with them. Those were the things I wanted to photograph. And then also, then they would tell me which pictures were useful and we, we would use them. And um, in the end, we had an exhibition. Well, we we got a lot of use from the photographs, but exhibitions and magazines, and newspapers, so on. So, uh, so it was, um, it was difficult and one of the best things I've ever done. Okay, um, I think, Laura, do you have questions from the audience? Hello? Laura, yeah. oh, Laura's not there. Okay. I am here, I just had to unmute myself. Yes, we oh, okay. do have questions. We have quite a few questions from uh, the audience. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, uh, where did it go? Okay, this one is for Terry. And um, one of our professors on campus, Chris Cohen, he, he would like to know how, if at all, does cubism inform your photo collage work? Um, it, it's, it's a whole school of art that I'm familiar with. I guess though, I'm not familiar enough with it to know if what I think about is actually connected. Um, but one of the things I do think about is uh, space and scale uh, in these pictures and how I can move from the foreground to the background, how the space can shift and there are little um, little things I've discovered that if I put this picture on top and cover up part of this other one with it, then it shifts, excuse me, it shifts the space dramatically. Uh, I find that extremely fun and interesting. So, and, or if I put, um, you know, if I put this picture of the foreground here and another one in the background, the space immediately uh, shifts. So, so I'm trying to be faithful to the place, just as I think the cubists were trying to be faithful to their subjects, but I'm also trying to make a picture. And, you know, I will say that working on this series is maybe the first time in my life where the exploration, the digital exploration of, of constructing an image is as much fun as being out at the tree or at the prairie itself. And that's a new experience for me and uh, really fun. You know, I, I mean, some of these are very hard to do. They, they take about a month or more to do. And sometimes even then I'll work on it a month and I'll think, no, nah, it's all wrong and I'll, go back in and um, have to keep moving things around. Um, and uh, so, so I, I don't think that's a very good answer to your question about uh, the influence of cubism, but that's how I work. I, I think that um, I'm not sure the cubists really care as much about the subject, what they what what they cut what they cut up are 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 layered in, you know, as an object and and cared. Um, I mean, I I think they were much more into formal transformation, mm -hmm. um, where they took an object, but in the orientation of it and the cropping of it and everything, there's a um a, a breaking of its identifying form into mm -hmm. a new mm -hmm. form. And so I think their their emphasis on formalism, where I think neither of you you lose a kind of respect for the uh, the place where you stood. 
Is that fair? Yeah. I, I would say that maybe a better comparison for me for the, would, and I'm not working exactly like Terry, but I have done pieces like that. And I think there's similarities. I think that would a better comparison would be say David Hockney and the work that, that he did you know, earlier in the 90s before, um, it was pre-digital pre basically, or was it 80s? I can't remember the dates, but um, you know, he was, he was saying, you know, photography is great if you're if you're like a one-eyed cyclops with your foot in the concrete or something, you know, and he's beginning to work through um, time and space, uh, different ways of putting pictures together where he was just taking snapshots and then laying them out and creating basically collages, you know, but that, that was before we could take the tools of Photoshop and do it on one continuous canvas and create this um, this document that can be printed onto one sheet of paper. But I remember looking at the Hockney work, thinking, "Damn, I wish I thought of that idea." You know, because that was that was kind of the the, in, the interest that I had about places changing and, and thinking about that. But when when uh, when the technology became available, that's when we started thinking about. Um, shifting from the collage, you know, to to the actual uh, canvas, and thinking about having having how you can put stuff together on one piece of paper. So I think there was this transition. You know, maybe it goes back to cubism, but there's all these intermediary steps that kind of happened along the way, some of which were photographic, and and so I think more about that lineage, I would suppose. But I don't know about Terry, but that's kind of the way I see it. Okay, Laura, do you have other questions? Thank you both. Um, yes, this one is for Mark. Mark, do you consider yourself a documentary photographer in any way? And if not, why not? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, we, before we, we started uh, this whole thing and we were just talking once we got onto Zoom and I was mentioning to Terry and to Ann that, you know, this last week was kind of a big week for AI, you know, artificial intelligence where, um, this, these new uh, consumer level um, software packages, you can take a historic photograph, like a family photograph, you know, from your, your family album. And it's a still picture of somebody that's long gone. I mean, maybe it's a picture made in the fifties or the twenties or something like that. And you can, they can take that picture and animate that face now and make it come alive, you know, because the, because the software has gotten so good that they can create this, this animation, you know? And, and so the possibilities of deep fake, you know, are, are really there. Uh, and, you know, so we're, we're on the edge of this, I think where it's so good now that you can't tell the difference between something that was created on a computer, like a, like a portrait or a person and animation and what was real. So this, this question of what a document is gets very complicated. Uh, I have thought that the work that I do uses a conventional documentary approach that is historically from, from the photographic standpoint. So I use a traditionally documentary approach with a camera and stuff like that. But my work begins to question what that document is because I think that's where we've been now for some time, especially in, in the realm of uh, digital work. Um, I just think we're on the cusp of seeing some very different things happening um, within photography that's going to make us question what a document is more and more. And, you know, what does it document? That's the question. What is being documented and who's making the statement? I think if, if I were a journalist, I'd be very concerned, very concerned, because how can you put something on a newspaper or on a television program and have people believe that now? Um, you know, and so they're, they're even doing things like, you know, trying to figure out how to trace Things. So they can prove that it's documentary. You know, I'm as an artist, though, it doesn't concern me as much because I think the difference between being a journalist and an artist is that I have license to make a statement. I have, in fact, I have, I'm required to make a statement as an artist. I mean, that's my whole job is to make a statement about something. So if the tools make it such that it's hard to tell whether it was real or not, I think it's less of an issue. It's me making a personal statement, and this is my opinion about what I'm doing. I've thought a lot of ways that landscape photography is basically an editorial commentary. You know, people who think that landscape is just a picture of what's out there, you know, rocks and trees or whatever. Well, I'm sorry, but that's mistaken. 
You know, it's, it's a picture that comes from someone. If it's Ansel Adams, maybe that person is hidden. You know, Ansel didn't want himself to be part of the overt part of the message. But, you know, in my work, and, you know, I've wanted myself to be part of the message that you can tell that it was me who made that because I think it's really important that I acknowledge that as the maker. That is the difference between documentary practice and artistic practice, at least for me. So I hope that answers the question. That, you know, maybe it's more than you ever wanted <laughs> to know, but that's that's what I think about it. Mark, um, three people should shoulder to shoulder and photograph the same three aspens from which Ansel made his famous three aspens photograph. Todd Webb and a woman whose name I'm blanking on, and she's the one that's missing, but Webb's is different enough. I mean, it's such a different peep. And, and according to Webb, they were standing almost shoulder to shoulder. Same mm -hmm. light, same day, mm -hmm. same everything. But in relation to what you were saying about um, documentary, because of a scandal about, it's been almost 10 years now, the uh, World Press photo, every photograph that's considered for an award is sent to a laboratory that literally analyzes whether the picture, the pictoles were manipulated mm -hmm. by pushing color, by taking somebody out, by in any way before they can be officially given the award now. Um, that's a test. Yeah, no, I think they're thinking of things like blockchain, you know, where you can you can begin to authenticate an original, you know, and so I think we're going to see that. And it's probably something that's going to happen in the collecting world, too, in terms of art. You know, I mean, how can you it's already happening. So people selling videos, you know, and there's kind of a blockchain thing that, you know, can it's not a reproduction. It's the real thing. It's an addition thing. And I, and I think the question is <laughs> into that. OK, Laura, another question? Yes, uh, this one is for Terry. Uh, Terry, the question is, what led you to realize that constructed images could recapture that sense of wonder you had in the beginning with your single shot photography of prairie grasses? OK, that's a good one. Uh, so I think, so I had, as I mentioned, I had this longing to revisit prairie and I went to this uh, small prairie in northern Indiana and it was so beautiful. It was right um, in high spring and I came back with all these pictures of grasses and I did what I'd always done up until then. I printed out a bunch of them and I put them up in a line on my front board and I thought, well, that's boring. You know, they just looked, um, it just, it was nothing like what I had experienced that morning. And so uh, I thought, well, what can I do? So then speaking of the, how we can work in Photoshop, then I, I printed out, I don't know, a couple dozen of these and I laid them down on the ground and I just started putting them together and I thought maybe if I sort of map them out together, it'll make more sense. And then I started seeing all these other things I could do. And then I realized I needed different sizes. And then I realized I can do this all in Photoshop. I don't have to cut these out and glue them together and then take them apart again and make different sizes. And so, uh, so, so then this whole universe opened up to me and I discovered all these things I could do with layering, layering them on top of one another, making the density change. And it, it was just uh, this magical uh, world. So I think, you know, I don't know how, uh, I think Anne was saying it takes a lot of courage. I don't know, I think it takes a lot of boredom. You know, first, um, and then, uh, you know, and then, and, and then you have to figure it out. You have to figure out what to do next. So all the time I was doing these, I thought no one is going to like these, but these are so much fun. And I just kept making them. So 
You know, I think also a lot of what happens when an artist makes a big change is uh, it's a lot of intuitive, almost unconscious happening that begins to surface and things begin to come together. I also was very influenced um, by an artist friend of mine, Ame Bobian, who um, she does things that I could never dream of in the way she um, uh, mixes and moves and changes colors. And uh, it's so exciting to me. And uh, had I not been looking a lot at her work, I might not have um, come up on this. I don't know. You know, I don't think we can ever quite explain that, you know, the, the, the evolution. Explaining takes out the magic. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's actually funny because this, this follow-up question is, is kind of related to uh, taking away the magic or, or your intuition. How, for Terry, how do you know you have what you need before you start piecing all of your photos together? Well, sometimes I don't have what I need. And so I have to go back. So for example, we were out in Kansas, um, I don't know, like January maybe. And there was a place I wanted to make a picture about. I didn't have an, enough days there because it snowed and covered everything up and finally melted. And when I came home, I, I had a couple of days worth of images, but they didn't, they didn't come together. There, was, there wasn't enough there. So I'll be going back again in a few weeks and I'll collect more because the weather hasn't shifted too much yet. It's still the same season. So I hope to get more that I can work with. Other times um, there was a willow tree that I made a picture of over at Jackson Park. And I would sometimes just get up from my desk, my, from my computer and go over there and you know, photograph some more and then come back and see if I had what I needed because I wouldn't know exactly what I needed. I would just know that I didn't, that I, that I didn't have enough yet. So I, I have to have, I have to have a lot of images to work with. Cause I, 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 cause I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know how the final image will turn out. If I did, I wouldn't make it, that would, that would not be interesting. Well, Mark, I have to... Can I just ask Mark, Mark, how did you all know when to stop putting your pictures into the canyon? Well, I don't know. That's a, it's kind of like what Terry's saying, you know, it, it's a very intuitive uh, thing. It, with the way that um, I would work with Byron on that kind of project would be that he, I would take the lead on some pieces and he would take the lead on other pieces. And when it came to that one picture of the homes where I embedded, I, would, I took the lead on that one and I, I just played around with it. He, he actually took the lead on doing a sky portion of it. So he was working on one thing and I was working on another thing. Um, his piece was about the, um, there was an interpretive guide that, that, uh, Holmes put out, which was a drawing and a labeled part. So we have two separate pieces on that. But I, I don't know. You know, I just, I just did it, and I thought this is too much. And sometimes you have to do too much, and then, you know, this is what painters know about. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I'd been a, if I'd been trained right as an artist, which I wasn't, uh, I would have experienced this a long time ago, and I would have understood something about it. Um, you know, that you do maybe you do it too much, and then then you got to step back and. I mean, the good thing about photography like this is that you can easily have multiple versions of something. So that's what sometimes we did do. We had multiple versions. Then I would throw it at then I would throw it at uh, Byron and say, "What do you think?" And then he would have his say on it. You know, and everything looks good, but this one doesn't. Let's replace that one. And so we would go back and forth. You know, it was this kind of thing that would happen. But I, you know, there was probably one version that had too much, and there was one version that had too little, and then this one seemed to work. You know. It was a set of balance, but then there was conceptual ideas, you know, Holmes wants to show a sunset and a sunrise, you know, we wanted to have that in ours too, you know, so we, we kind of played with the responding to the original piece and then, you know, deciding what to put in it, how big to, a piece to put in. I mean, that was another thing. It was all just very, when you, when I first dealt with that, I don't know about Terry, but when I first dealt with that um, open range of possibilities, 
you know, that Photoshop gives you, it's kind of terrifying, you know, like, oh, I can do anything, but wait a minute, I, I want to have some boundaries here. And, you know, and I think what, you know, what artists tend to do is they, 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 they love to have the ability to do anything, but at the same time, they need some limitations. And so the limit, the best limitations are the ones you impose yourself. I'm going to get only going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. And they, you develop rules. They tend to have conceptual underpinnings. And then you, you say, okay, I'm going to develop it in, in this particular manner. Uh, but I think every piece that we've done could have had four or five different outcomes and we would have been probably happy in some way with them, but it's just the, uh, the way it you know, turns out, I guess. Okay, Laura, you have another? I have another uh, question for you, Mark. Um, this is from um, another professor on campus uh, who you met earlier, Leslie Shipley. So she, um, she, she asked, do you think your re-photographing, photographing, sorry, practice has affected the way you see not just the landscape itself, but also how you see the history of landscape photography in the United States and the work of people like O'Sullivan and Carlton Watkins? Yeah, she, well, I'm sorry, is that it? Yeah. Uh, there's more. She's, she's, okay. curious, she's curious about any insights or thoughts you have on the historic role of the camera in shaping cultural perceptions of the American West. Oh, wow. That's a really big question. <laughs> A really good that's, that's a book yeah yeah I, I think this that's a yeah that see that this is the phd dissertation right here i mean i feel like um i cannot underestimate the the impact that photography has had on perception of the american west i mean i just think it's so it was so critical you have to think about the fact that that there was this great coincidence which uh you know the, at the time that the white people were from the east were going west and, and investigating it for the surveys. You know, they're the four major surveys of the American West, King, Wheeler, Powell, and Hayden surveys, that they, it was after the Civil War and photography had just gotten to the point technologically where they could take the camera into the field and make these pictures. And so of course they wanted photographers to go with them. It wasn't just to document the scenes, it was to create um, value, you know, so when they went back to Congress and asked for more money the next year, they could say, look what we're doing. We're doing great work. You need to support us again. So, um, but what they, what the photographers were doing was they were making the very first photographs of the American West. So, you know, they, they, um, they didn't have any precedents. There, there was no previous art. There was no previous way of looking at something except what they got from earlier examples with the Hudson River School or you know other European photography and so forth, they brought that with them and then they chose features. You know, they said, oh, that looks like a teapot, I'll photograph teapot rock. And here's another one that looks like this. And so they were creating icons. They were creating the iconography of the American West. And it's been my position that even though most people have not seen those photographs from those, that survey period, they've been influenced by them because those pictures have trickled down into everything, you know, from contemporary photography to modernist works, to souvenir, you know, photographs, to, you know, photographs that you see, nature photography, you know, everything is kind of comes in a stream from that, um, that basic historical act of making those pictures. And, and so I don't think you can understate that, the, the, the value and the importance of photography in the American West. And then that photography influenced a lot of other places around the world. So, you know, O'Sullivan, who, you know, and Jackson and some of the others who were working for surveys, one might be, you know, assume that they were making scientific works or something like that but in fact they were it was multitasking you know they were making works that were meant to document but they were also meant to be um you know shilling the survey so they could get more money they they were also in they were also influenced by the make by the makers and the and the things that that were influencing them at the time don't forget these were you know white guys going out there saying what can we do to this landscape that we now inherited overlooking the Native Americans who were there and, and everybody else. And so, you know, th this was, it was wrapped up in the whole cultural premise of, of um, the, the Westward movement. And I think you can look at the photography is, is a very complicated and complex example of what was happening culturally 
at that time. And it's really at the forefront. You know, if we examine that, uh, we can understand where our roots are, you know, in terms of the of how we see these places, because in it really is the basis for how we understand who we are and the place that we live in. We've inherited that. Mark, one of the things that fascinated me when we were doing our interview was the point at which you all began to turn around and look at what hadn't been photographed. Mm -hmm. You became aware of this um, definitive view versus, you know, thinking about whether that, you know, <coughs> I mean, and, and I think, am I right in that that was sort of permission giving for you for this in, increasingly expansive mm -hmm. uh, approach that you took? Yeah, well, part of it was, you know, what's not being photographed, so to the left or the right or behind or something like that. And that's where the panoramic view like that's in the exhibition kind of starts to illuminate that. You know, you begin to see what was around where the picture was made. But then at a certain point, we realized that we didn't want to be stuck at that vantage point either. You know, what, what else was happening? <coughs> so we, we ended up um, like with Third View, which I didn't really talk about, but when we created what became a multimedia piece that included sound and, and video and, and interviews and still photographs and animations and all these different things for Third View on, on the DVD we published, um, you know, we were able to think about um, what, if you go back to these places, what do you encounter now? So if you go to a place like Teapot Rock at Green River, Wyoming, you know, it's littered with, um, you know, contemporary artifacts, you know, uh, a photo album that somebody threw in the sagebrush, you know, a, a, a Western music tape that was wound around the brush, you know, and, and things that talk about culture that tell us about this place. I mean, if you think about the 19th century surveys, they, they not only had photographers and scientists, they often had ethnographers and, you know, people who were looking at the totality of the experience there. If, if we go back to a place today and say, it, you know, if our roots are these earlier pictures, what can we dig out of the experience today that surrounds these pictures? And that was the kind of premise of the third view, going beyond the rephotography. So that's what that's what we did. I mean, looking not just around the view, but what constitutes our understanding of this place now that came that was rooted in that view, you know, later and how it's changed. And and by the way, that teapot rock they where O'Sullivan photographed it in the 1860s, they built a hotel. <laughs> I, they, I mean, right on the exact spot where he stood. I stayed in this room, which I think was like two floors above where he stood and they made a picture of this place. But it, it was, um, you know, I mean, we, we kind of understand our relationship to this place and how it's changed. I, and I think it's mind boggling, actually. Um, um, okay, go ahead, Lucy. Yeah, I just have one final question, if that's okay, um, to ask of Terry. Um, this one's from a student, so I want to make sure and get a student question in. Um, Terry, for your constructed images, is, it, is there one particular um, aspect that is more difficult to um, combine? So she's asking if it's um, the plants, the horizons, the sky. It, are there are more areas that are, are, more, are more challenging to compose. Well, that's a very interesting question. I can tell this student has experience with making pictures of some kind. And yes, um, that's why um, I started the series about the, the bur oak. I wanted to see if I could make a tree that came above the horizon line. You know, how, how would I deal with all of that space? Up until then, I had done something more like what you see behind me where it's mostly grass and it goes up and then a little bit of sky uh, at the top. And so, uh, so there's, yeah, there, there are a lot of problems or questions with, you know, I can't, that one of those pictures with the sky, I can't put that down in the bottom third. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, so that, so in order for the picture to be convincing, um, 
I have to have foreground pictures, middle ground pictures, and background, or, you know, sky. But I don't even like to think that way. So part of the fun and the challenge becomes in, in trying to figure out what I can do that maybe didn't seem to make sense, but that is still convincing. Hmm. Does that, is that an answer to that? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I have to play the 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 um un, the uh, unpopular uh, role of ending our uh, Berlin symposium for today. This has been uh, really wonderful. Um, and do you have anything, any closing remarks you want to make before I sign us uh, all? No, but one of my pleasures is that every time I'm with these two, I learn. Uh, something more, which is, um, is, is the challenge and the pleasure. Um, and you'd think having interviewed Mark for five days, I would have <laughs> covered it, but no, I'm still learning uh, because he's still thinking and he's still making new and the whole AI direction now is absolutely fascinating. And where, um, Terry, where we didn't go that I, you know, if we kept going, I'm re you spoke of your feelings for a place and the question I'll, we'll, we will get to it maybe over dinner is how a change of feelings each time you go, being in a different head place each time you go back affects, you know, what you come home with. So that's, you know, dinner in Chicago uh, as soon as we can make it. Um, I, I'd like so, to be a fly on the wall. Maybe you wouldn't want me to be a fly on the wall in your restaurant in Chicago to listen <laughs> to this conversation. Why I'd not a person at the that. table? Let, yeah, wait, why don't we just too. elevate you to a person at the <laughs> table, not fly <laughs> on the wall? Um, no, I want to thank everybody who attended, and I hope some of you will have a chance to see the show. And again, I want to thank Martha and, and, and Lucy and, and everybody at the, on the staff who has hung the work and, and made all the arrangements. And um, of course, Mary Shockey, who, who made it possible. And, um, you know, I, I hope that, um, I just hope that it, it's been stimulating for you uh, because uh, it's, it's smart work. It's really smart work. And if you give it the time, um, I think it could be just as good as attending a seminar. Um, just using your own bread, head to look at this work and ask the questions and and then walk through the galleries at the other, the 19th century paintings and the other landscapes that we have in the galleries and think about the decisions those artists make. 